right now in a West London tower block. We'll speak to our reporter live at the scene. I was wakened by my son who phoned me to say, look, have you seen this fire? And it was then that I switched on television to watch it live and was absolutely horrified by what I saw. The London Fire Brigade right now are dealing with a serious fire in a tower block, Grenfell Tower, 23-storey residential block of flats in Kensington. I was angry at the incident and knowing it could have been avoided, very clearly could have been avoided. On the 14th of June, 2017, people across the country watched as Grenfell Tower burned. Simply burning it out of control, completely out of control. For some, this was history repeating itself. I've been retired from the fire service for a very long time now. But when I saw the pictures from Grenfell, my thought is, oh my God, not again. In the decades before Grenfell, Five fires across the British Isles gave clear warnings of the tragedy, but key lessons were ignored. My question is the same as your question. How? Residents of the tower are still trapped. Details at the moment not yet clear. Turned on the telly and just burst into tears. It's just like my sister's fire. You just think this is just crazy. Why has this happened again? The Grenfell disaster was the direct result of decades of failures. Failures that allowed the tower to be wrapped in a cladding that turned the building into an inferno. Failures that saw people told to stay put in their homes as the tower burned. Oh my God, and failures to protect the building from the spread of fire, creating a death trap that took the lives of 72 people. When you go home tonight, hug your loved ones. Cherish every moment with them. Because until those in power listen and make changes to a system that fails, only God knows how many homes are safe in this country. This is the story of five fires and the warnings that should have stopped Grenfell. People don't realize that fire is a living thing. It breathes and it roars and you feel it. Forty-four years before Grenfell came Summerland the deadliest fire in the British Isles since the Blitz. Summerland was an attempt to provide sunshine at 52 weeks of the year. It was a building designed specifically to provide entertainment for tourists and local folk. It was huge and could cater for up to 5,000 people. Summerland was one of the largest indoor holiday parks in Europe taken on Benidorm with a pioneering design that wrapped the building in a plastic called Oroglass to create the illusion of artificial sunshine. Summerland was amazing. It absolutely took your breath away when you first saw it. We couldn't believe it. So we're four girls, dancers. We've arrived on the aeroplane from London and we went to this huge building, almost like a holiday camp atmosphere, very family orientated. The entrance was very small. That was the first thing. Even for a five-year-old child, it looked tiny. This huge, big building and this tiny entrance. We went inside, and I describe it as uh, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I was absolutely mesmerized. It just opened into this huge expanse. It was fantastic in that, that you could get a tan inside, even if it rained outside. I was 17 years old. We used to do one dance routine in the main arena, the family arena. We were about to go on stage and somebody said they could smell smoke. 
We, we kind of turned to each other and we said we might get the night off. Outside the building, three boys smoking cigarettes had set light to a crazy golf kiosk. The fire travelled undetected up the inside of a flammable cladding called Galbestos until it caught on the oroglass at the top of the building. And once that oroglass caught fire, it took a grip and it was so sudden. Dad had spotted smoke coming out through a ventilation shaft and an announcement was made from the floor. Nobody panic, um, you know, there's nothing to worry about. So people didn't and people didn't actually move. Told to stay put by staff, 3,000 holidaymakers remained in the building as the Oroglass turned Summerland into a death trap. Then it happened very suddenly. Just total pandemonium. The place erupted into flames. People started to shout and I turned to look back and I could see all the pear specks starting to make a noise and melt and stuff. And I thought, well, we better get out of here. It was floor to ceiling flames absolutely floor to ceiling flames, and the heat was almost in instantaneous. It was smelting and, and burning lumps from the, from the roof. As if it was a, a waterfall of flames is the only way I, I, I've ever been able to describe it, because that's how it looked. It fell on people's backs. A lot of people had back injuries. Um, Dad's hair was on fire. I can remember seeing somebody throwing their child over the balcony in the hope somebody would catch them, the, the baby. And then we had to run through the flames and I was badly burnt at that point. You know, and I thought, I'm going to die in front of all these people. I don't know how I knew what death was at five, but I was afraid. There's absolute pandemonium here. The summer land is ablaze and blazing down. The fire is spreading very rapidly indeed. Just the one fire engine has arrived at the moment. One fire engine, this is just ridiculous. Where is the rest of the fire brigade? I was off that evening. I was getting ready with my wife to go out for a night out. Didn't make getting out because my fire bell went just after eight o'clock. I ran up to the fire station. Lad in control said it's Summerland. Round down Victoria Street and at the far end of the promenade there was a very large pole of smoke and a ball of fire along the full length of the roof. Enormous thing. Wow, this is the big one. They, they told you to sit still. Don't stay where we were. We're all right. There's no need for panic. Yes. There's another uh, fire engine coming along. Here comes the police now. We went in through the main door. There was an enormous roar from the fire, like a, an old steam express train going through a station. And an updraft that would virtually seem to lift your helmet off your head. It was, I've never experienced anything like that before or since. People are calling all over the place, looking round for children, and and families are split up. Oh, yes, I love. So nice. Yes, he, he, there's a lot of children coming down with other people. You see. Oh, that no, 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 no. There are lots of people coming down. You're all right, my love. We started to move across the main floor area, jetting as we went. There was a lot of burning material dropping down on us. It wasn't just flammable; it melted, uh, gave off huge amounts of black smoke and it dripped gobules of, of burn and acrylic falling down, which were landing on people inside, but it was also spreading the fire very rapidly inside. The flames are roaring out of the windows. It's as if it's made of plastic. Where we escaped, we had to escape over bodies. And I looked down at my hands and I couldn't understand what was wrong. The fingers were webbed like a duck. That's the way my fingers were. The skin was just, it was just all melted. As you can imagine, a, a great amount of anguish. People that are looking for members of their families. We lived quite close to Summerland. We walked over and we were faced with this scene. It looked like something out of the jaws of hell. It looks as if there's no hope for Summerland without a shadow of a doubt. I saw a tiny little fireman training his hose onto this huge tsunami wall of fire. And I remember thinking, it's too little, it's too late. That building was gone. 
We didn't put this fire out. The fire burned itself out. It's been going half an hour, and the place is just a shell. It's like as if it was made of matchboxes. Fifty people died at Summerland, including eleven children. A month later, a public inquiry was launched to learn lessons from the Summerland fire. The Lieutenant Governor of the Isle of Man pledged that the inquiry would be independent and impartial. A High Court judge came from the UK uh, supported by Home Office inspectors involved with the, the, the fire industry and there was a, a full inquiry into exactly what happened. The fire burnt out the building with its acrylic plastic walls and roof within minutes. Today the experts were particularly keen to find any remaining bits of the acrylic sheet which according to some reports melted dropping balls of fire on people trying to flee the burning building. The inquiry found that the building had been wrapped in highly flammable materials causing the fire's rapid spread and high death toll. This is a sheet of horror glass. Nobody realised the extent to which horror glass was lethal. And the sheet of horror glass is now well alive. I actually um, saved a couple of small samples myself and discovered that it was an excellent fire lighter, so obviously not suitable for use in a building. The inquiry also found that the advice to people to stay put in Summerland seriously hindered the evacuation. My view ever since that day is if you have a fire, you get people out. They also found that corners had been cut when Summerland was built. To save money, sprinklers weren't installed. Sprinklers are designed to, to detect a fire, to keep a fire in check. It might not extinguish it, but to keep it in check. Would it have saved the building? Probably. It certainly would have made for a much smaller fire. The impact of the Summerland Inquiry was felt across the British Isles. The final report recommended the installation of sprinklers in all large buildings and the tightening of outdated building regulations. The legislation in the Isle of Man changed. Um, and going on from that, the legislation in the UK also changed. In 1975, the House of Commons passed the so-called Summerland Amendments that strengthened building regulations throughout the UK. The new law specified that external walls of large buildings must always be fire resistant. As far as cladding and flammable materials in buildings, that whole situation was addressed because of what happened at Summerland. Nothing like it should ever have happened again in the UK. Eighteen years after Summerland, the newly installed cladding on a tower block in Liverpool caught fire. This is Nosley Heights, long a heated eyesore. It's a dump, absolute dump. I come out of a dump into a super dump. Inside, many of these houses are simply rotting away. With fungus on the walls, these flats have become a nightmare to live in. In the mid-80s, the Conservative government launched a state action, a scheme to improve living conditions in tower blocks. The renovations at Nosley Heights was to address a problem of basically damp. So the idea was to provide low-cost heating and a major part of that would be to overclad the block. The contractors said that ours was the first in the country to ever have it fitted. We were all excited at like, what it was going to look like afterwards and that. And it did, it, it looked fantastic. Now we have a mock-up here, a full-scale mock-up of what we're doing to the building. And it really is an overcoat on the face of the building. This was a new concept. 
something that was going to be the saviour of high-rise blocks throughout Britain and beyond into Europe. The fire began in the early hours of the morning. I was living on the 10th floor of Nosley Heights. I think I was in bed, but I could smell like smoke. And when I went out onto the land, and it was thick black. So I started banging on all the neighbours' doors, trying to wake them up and alert them that there was a fire. As I was coming down the stairwell, the windows were just melting away and the smoke was coming through, the flames were like shooting through. That was our only exit. It just took hold so quick and that and went right up from the bottom, right up to the top. We could see it for miles. I was awoken by the sound of the police helicopters. So I got up, grabbed all the, the keys, ran down and assisted the fire brigade in evacuating the block. At the base of the tower, units had set fire to some discarded furniture. The flames from that furniture uh, obviously got into the cladding somehow. This space here is the ventilation space to allow any of the moist air coming from the building or from the back of the cladding to escape. It acted as a chimney and just went. Our water that we were spraying was just hitting metal cladding, the external metal cladding, and bouncing away. Then the problem is, how do you deal with it? How do you extinguish the fire the best you possibly can? Uh, and it was virtually impossible. We just simply could not stop the escalation of that fire. You know, we were lucky that we could get people out in good time. People were evacuated safely. There was no loss of life. More than 60 residents were evacuated from the building and three people, including a child, were treated in hospital. With the cladding, it looked as though it disintegrated. It hung in strings. We were kind of lucky um, compared to, like, Grenville. Somebody took a decision to wrap uh, a residential tower block with flammable material. Um, as a firefighter, that made me angry. We were very, very lucky with Nosley Heights. Uh, well, you know, we dodged a bullet. Knowsley Heights was Britain's first tower block cladding fire, but investigators found that the cladding was legal. Six years before, in a drive to cut red tape, Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government reduced over 300 pages of building regulations to just 26. To help the construction industry meet the new laws, a guidance document was introduced to work alongside the new building regulations. It was called Approved Document B. Approved Document B was guidance which outlined the sort of material products that could be used in construction work generally and, for instance, cladding. Very, very important document. After Nosley, Approved document B was updated to more closely define what type of materials were permitted. But crucially, cladding was not required to be fireproof. I thought lessons were learned from Nosley Heights at the time, that building regs were changed. I thought the lessons had already been learned. Almost a decade later, a cladding fire in Western Scotland echoed what happened at Knowsley Heights, but this time it proved fatal. Garnet Court is one of five high rise housing blocks in the town. Over the years, I did attend several fires in the high-rise blocks, and they were all dealt with and contained, but those were before they had been renovated. The cladding was added to the flats, not for insulation purposes or anything, just purely for decorative measure. There was a red wing, a blue wing, a yellow wing. The, it, it was like panels, sort of 
below and above the windows. People talked about how garish they were. Just didn't look nice at all. I mean, this cladding was put in flats all over Scotland, but nobody really realised the underlying problems that were there with it. And it took Garnet Court to bring those problems to light. After 18 years of Conservative rule, the Labour Party were now in power with a huge majority. MP Brian Donohoe lived a few minutes' walk from Garnock Court. By chance, I happened to be at home and heard all the noise of sirens and looked out and f saw the smoke. I was there before 10 minutes of the fire starting, as were the fire brigade. And so I saw the actual fire and I saw it moving up the building. And it was rapid. We could see as we were approaching the building that the fire had broken through the window of the fifth floor. It quickly became apparent that the fire was taking grip on the outside of the building and proceeding upwards. It was obviously a very acrid smoke because of what was on fire. It was plastic that was on fire. The flames leapt out the windows, caught the cladding on the flat above, set that alight, piggybacked then up to the cladding in the flat above. It then went up the next cladding and it did that every floor all the way to the top. There was cladding, it was smouldering and burning, and it was dropping from under the windows onto the top of the fire engine. Panes of glass were blown out and just falling straight down the building. I mean, it was coming down like spears. If anybody had got hot with it, they'd have been killed. As the fire raced up the cladding, dozens of people were still inside, including resident William Linton. I do remember the elderly gentleman was in a wheelchair and he had dropped his cigarette and that was initially how the fire had actually started, with a dropped light. Firefighter Ian Murray tried to rescue Linton from his burning flat. I donned the breathing apparatus set and I opened the door. The hall was well alight and thick with smoke. So we went in and we extinguished what was on fire in the hallway. But the living room was surprisingly clear. And the reason for that was there was absolutely no window left. Everything was absolutely going. I could see daylight, and it was a bright sunny day. I found the man's dog. Unfortunately, it had passed away, but couldn't find him at all. There was literally no sign of a, a body being there, although I found out later that there was. Forensic investigators later found the charred remains of William Linton in his flat. The headline was, the cladding was to blame, which I thought was pretty strong and pretty to the point and said it all, didn't it? The fire at Garnet Court was a clear warning to the dangers of combustible cladding nationwide. Having seen the fire firsthand, and realising there was another four blocks of a similar nature with the same cladding, it was something that required immediate attention. At Westminster, Brian Donohoe was part of a select committee inquiry into the dangers of combustible cladding on tower blocks. Clearly on the basis of the evidence that I saw at first hand, it would give the impression that there is something quite wrong in the use of this cladding. It was a short report, I mean, with 10 recommendations made, that under no circumstances would there be any use of this particular cladding or windows in high-rise flats. The Select Committee's report concluded, we do not believe that it should take a serious fire in which many people are killed before all reasonable steps are taken towards minimising the risks. It does almost read like a prediction of Grenfell Tower. It says that the danger of a cladding system is the fire may exit the building at one floor, spread up the building and re-enter the building on another floor. And obviously that is what happened on a massive scale at uh, a Grenfell Tower. In December 1999, the committee's final report was submitted to the government. So whose office received the recommendation? The office of the Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott. But the response was poor and the response virtually kicked what 
was made his recommendations into the long grass. After Garnet Court, the government responded that the current guidance, as defined in approved document B, was sufficient to keep tower blocks safe from fire. The British Parliament got it wrong. Yet, nearly 20 years later, we have 72 people dying. And the cladding was largely to blame, and I think that's horrific. When the warning, stark, stark warning was there, it's absolutely terrible. Why didn't more take place in Westminster? It could have been avoided, very clearly could have been avoided. Garnet Court was a lesson that unfortunately hasn't been learned by any of the governments that have been in position. Six years after Garnet Court, a fire broke out on the 14th floor of a tower block in Stevenage. This time, the death toll was higher. What happened was a part of my life, and it could have been a part of my death. I was petrified, I'm not going to lie. The fire was started by some tea lights owned by a Mr Savage. They had placed the candles on top of a small TV that was in the bedroom and they went to sleep leaving the two tea lights alight. They got so hot that they melted into the television set itself. He then wakes up about quarter to three. The flame was now six or eight inches tall. He left the room, and when he came back, the fire had developed so much that he was unable to get back into the bedroom where his partner was. I was on the 14th floor watching TV, and then there was a lot of commotion. There was obviously sirens, there was people yelling, screaming. So I got up and looked out of my window, and literally all you could see is flames everywhere. And I was like, OK, so then I dialed 999 because I needed to know what to do. I obviously rang and said where I was, explained the situation, and they did say, look, stay put, you're safer if you stay put. Someone will come and get you. So I did. The fire brigade's stay put policy is based on the idea that each flat is self-contained built with materials that can withstand fire for long enough that people can be rescued. The advice at the time was to stay put. They were safer in their flat than they would be walking around the building and trying to find an exit. Theoretically, you've got an hour plus time yeah, to enable the fire service to get the scene under control and then evacuate in a safe way. The instinct is to run, but you do follow their advice because they are they know best because they're trained. As Harrow Court burned, Michelle Camilleri waited for over an hour to be rescued. It's really hard not to panic, but I kept looking out the window, obviously, because I needed to see how it was progressing because I have my children in the flat. I rang them again and they did say, stay put, it is safer and they will get to us, I did then decide I'm not listening. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die trying to escape. And then I just grabbed my children and ran. Firefighters Michael Miller and Jeff Wernham went to the flat where the fire started to try to rescue the residents trapped inside. Mike and Jeff went in they saved the man. Then my brother actually turned around to one of the other firefighters, Helen, and said, I can't wait to see this in the papers. And then him and Jeff went back in to save the woman.
we're not 100% certain what type of fire phenomena happened, yeah, because there's loads of different names for them, backdrafts and flashovers. One of these events happened whilst Michael was in the bedroom searching. It struck Michael down uh, there and then in, in the flat. Jeff had received some injuries, but he was able to get himself out of the flat. Uh, his body was found in, in the lobby. Um, the fire in flat 85 claimed the life of resident Natalie Close and the two firefighters who tried to save her. I don't know how to describe it. It was devastating. They were both young men. They were at the start of their career. They went to work and didn't come home. He was so excited about being in the fire service. You know, my brother did like that feeling of, yeah, I've, I've helped someone, I've saved someone. And to me, he has always been a hero. And, and I, I miss that a lot. After a two year investigation into Harrow Court, the Fire Brigade's union called for a review of the stay put policy in tower blocks. The stay put advice is the right advice provided everything is right. Throughout this investigation, we found that there was flaws. It was dependent on so many variables so that it was questionable whether that was the right advice now. The Fire Brigade's union also called for sprinklers to be fitted in all tower blocks. Very few buildings uh, of that style have got sprinklers in them. If sprinklers had been installed in Harrow Court before the fire, what do you think would have been the difference in how it had played out? The, the uh, two firefighters and, and the uh, one the resident wouldn't have died, probably. After the inquest, the coroner identified the report's findings as being of national significance and sent them to the Department for Communities and Local Government for consideration. But the call to install sprinklers in existing tower blocks was rejected and the stay put advice remained in place. How did the government's response make you feel? Deflated um, at the end of it. You know, why isn't it so obvious that this needs to be done? Four years after Harrow Court, a fire in the heart of South London would again expose the weaknesses of the building regulations and the fire brigade's stay put policy. This time, six people would die. It was a beautiful summer's day. There was a wind, but it was a warm wind. Opening windows, curtains fluttering out. I was indoors that day, just over across the road there, and I got a shout over there was a fire in Lackadall. And we run over there, then suddenly it's gone woof. At 4.15 on a hot July afternoon, a faulty television started a fire on the ninth floor at Lackanau House. On the day of the fire, I was doing something on the computer and they kept on asking me, Mom, are you cooking? I'm, I'm not cooking. Mom, something is burning. We smell something. There was like this strange smell coming. So I asked, Mom, are you cooking anything? And I simply said, there is nothing on the cooker. There is nothing in the oven. Mom, something is smelling. What is it? It was black and very thick and sooty. I was only five, but I thought, this doesn't look good, it doesn't smell good. Something is wrong. I looked out of the window, saw the smoke was coming from our neighbor's flat, and the windows were melting. 
When I opened the front door, I saw smoke had started filling the communal corridors, but it was at the ceiling level. And I thought, if I'm not out now, I'm in trouble. On the 11th floor, Rashid knew who was in his flat with his wife and two daughters. One of our daughters got up for drink and uh, saw smoke billowing up from the flats uh, underneath ours. He called 999. The operator followed fire brigade policy, telling him to stay put and await rescue. When we didn't see any help, you know, we kept phoning them again, and they just kept on telling us to calm down and just wait for help to come. I thought it was preposterous, you know, that how could you tell people to stay in the burning building, you know? Hello, <laughs> Down the hall from the Nuhu family lived dressmaker Catherine Hickman. She was working from home when she saw the fire and also called 999. I'm at flat 79 and the flat below me, there's flames coming out the window. Right, OK, you need to stay in your flat, in your flat. The fire brigade yes. is on their way to you right now. But the fire's below me in the flat below? Yeah, I know the fire's below you, which is why you can't go down. Right, OK. OK, what flat number are you in? Flat 79. Flat 79. Yes. Six minutes after the first 999 call, the fire brigade arrived. It was just a scene of chaos, basically. There was people running around, there was smoke coming out of sort of like two or three levels, stuff dropping down. You could see it with catching curtains and stuff like that. And then once the heat, the tension and the heat got bigger, it went back up. By now, the fire itself had worsened. It was more the colour of the smoke than the flame, and the blacker the smoke is, generally the hotter the fire is and the more toxic whatever's burning is, and it was very, very black. Information was coming across the radio about various people stuck in various flats. So, yeah, we were, we were very aware that people were in there. <laughs> At the foot of the building, a crowd had gathered, including local MP Harriet Harmon. What was so terrible is that it was blindingly obvious to everybody who was standing there, all of us who were behind the cordon, we could all see at the time that the fire had spread. It was not contained in one flat. It wasn't even contained in one floor. It was roaring up the building. And the trouble was, when the facts were blindingly obvious, the fact that the fire had spread, the fire brigade was still telling people to stay put in their flats. And those flats were no longer safe. They'd become a death trap. I can hear there's lots of people in the flat. Right, and next we're getting to... lots and lots of calls. There's lots of people in the same situation. Yeah, yeah I'm OK. I'm OK as, as long as you put the fire out. I'm going to stay and talk to you, OK? OK. A few doors down from Catherine, the new who's had taken shelter with two other families in their neighbor's flat. We started seeing smoke coming in. The lady just told all of us to go into our bathroom, opening our bathroom cupboards, bringing out a towel, dry towel, and wetting them up, you know, that we should use it to cover our face. You know, there's a vent on the wall, and the smoke started coming in through that vent. And at that point, I thought, no. The New Who family left five of their neighbours in the bathroom and ran for the balcony. I was banging on the side of the wall, please come up, come and help us. We've got 10 people here, children here, you know? I hope my neighbours, I don't know if they're in, but their windows are open. Don't worry about your neighbours for now. We'll take care of them, all right? Should I go downstairs or anything? In the corridor? No, don't go out of the flat. No, OK. If you open the door, you don't know what's the other side of it, and neither do I at this stage. No, OK, then, OK. Firefighter Simon Towler was asked to go to the 11th floor to try and rescue the trapped residents. The officer in charge said to us, we're not telling you to go up, but we're asking you to go up because you have no backup. Um, but we just like, yeah. We'll go, we're fine, we'll, we'll just do it. 
Must have been about fifth or sixth floor, I suppose. Smoke started coming down. Couldn't really see masses, but you knew it was a staircase. So we just kept on going up and up and up. Oh, the heat from here, can't Oh my god, oh my god. There's black smoke coming right up outside my window. Yeah, okay. Don't worry about it, okay, because we know where you are. Yeah. You're going to be fine, and I'm going to stay on the phone until the fireman gets you, okay? Yeah, but there's fire coming through my floorboards now. I'm in smoke. Right, okay. What should I do? Should I get out? Right, go into another room. Yeah. Okay, the fire crews are there now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we told them where you are. Okay. In the corridor, Simon Towler was fighting the fire just metres away from where Catherine Hickman was trapped. It was just surreal, really. The fire door was hanging off on its hinges. So the fire had just gone through that door. As we're looking up above us, the flames were coming above our head, all sorts of different colors. And we're thinking, we had no idea what sort of fire we're dealing with here. The air was being drawn in from the outside and just basically like a blowtorch. The ceiling was alight, the walls were alight, the floor was alight, everything was alight. So it was just like, what do we do? What, what can we do? At one point, I remember looking down the corridor, it was just a light from the bottom right through to the far end, and it starts to then come round over the top and round behind us. And we're like, we, we, we've got to get out. We, we, if we don't get out now, we're never going to get out. Rashid knew who was still trapped on the balcony. I felt this uh, sharp heat. I looked towards that direction and I saw this massive fireball. That fireball was in uh, Catherine Hickman's uh, flat. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Can you make any noise so that I know you're listening to me? Catherine, can you make any noise? Can you bang your phone or anything? Catherine, are you there? I think that's the phone gone. The Nuhu family were trapped for 40 minutes until a team of firefighters fought their way to the balcony to save their lives. You know, we went down through the stairwell, and, but although the stairwell was completely black, smoke-filled, we didn't know the fate of the people we left behind. In the bathroom, rescuers found five bodies. Diana Franceschini and her children, Felipe and Thais. With her was neighbor Helen Udoka and her three-week-old daughter, Michelle. Catherine Hickman was found in flat 79. She'd been on the phone to the fire brigade for more than half an hour before she died. What happened in Lackanor is the people who escaped with their lives were the people who disobeyed the instructions and just got out. And the people who died were the people who accepted the instructions of the fire authorities. The standard operating procedure at the time was stay put, we know you're there, we'll get you rescued. But I think the intensity of this fire was just so much it swept away that advice. Us three girls growing up on the farm, you know, we didn't have friends around that much because we just had each other. Yeah. So yeah. we were really close. As sisters, weren't we? Yeah. We went up to London shortly after and saw the flat. And we can see from the pictures the bottom half of our flat was completely burnt out. The fire got so hot that it was like melting concrete. You can even see where she was sewing. We couldn't understand why she hadn't mm. hadn't got out it's just it wasn't until like quite a while after nearly two weeks almost and then we learned that she'd been on the phone to the fire brigade and she died on the phone for 40 minutes and i just remember just 
uncontrollably crying bent over because I just hoped that she'd maybe fallen asleep on the sofa in the heat. To know that and to know that she was, you know, obviously conscious and waiting to be saved. Yeah, she kept saying the worst, on the phone, oh, they're the going to come and get me, aren't they? Me. You know, is someone coming to get me? I'm not going to die here. You know, and to know that, it's just... Four years later, the Lackanel House inquest examined the fire brigade's stay put policy. That stay put policy is a sensible one where the fire service personnel can rely on the compartmentalisation of those blocks working. Provided compartmentalisation works, stay put works. The theory was that each flat is hermetically sealed as far as fire is concerned. But two years before the fire, the council had refurbished the exterior of the building with flammable panels. The research that we did suggested that the law prescribed that they should be at least one hour fire resistant, and in fact, they only survive for four minutes. You know, four minute fire resistance is no resistance at all. Despite this, the coroner ruled that the panelling met fire safety standards as set out in approved document B. The coroner said herself that she found the building regulations and approved document B very, very difficult to, to understand. Approved document B was impenetrable. You know, we had a room full of QCs and junior barristers there and it was impenetrable. Everybody agreed that it was ambiguous and un unclear. The council had also installed four ceilings that allowed the fire to spread meaning flats were no longer compartmentalised. This undermined the stay-put advice given to residents. If fire safety is based on a fire not spreading in a tower block, and if the fire has spread, you have to change your instructions. Probably for me, if someone from the fire brigade was saying, stay where you are, I'd be thinking, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna come and get me. And that's why she, she we believe that she stayed there. She would have done, yeah, she would have done as she's sort of told, really. Three years before the fire, approved document B had been updated for the second time under the Labour government. The guidance change regarding cladding was small, but significant. Instead of full-scale testing, Data testing was now permitted, simulating the effects of fire on materials instead of testing them for real. There is no doubt at all that that amendment had an adverse impact on the safety of, for instance, tower blocks. Well, I was fire minister when uh, the document was published, so I was given uh, the best professional advice available to me as fire minister, and I took that advice. That's my, that was my job. Whether that guidance is strong enough in hindsight, obviously, is uh, very much open to question. The end result is a system that allows people to put flammable cladding on buildings. The end result of a whole chain of events, a whole chain of decisions that have created that uh, safety regime, or in reality, the lack of a safety regime. The Lackanau House inquest also looked at whether sprinklers could have saved lives. All modern high-rise buildings are fitted with sprinklers. The question is whether high-rise buildings built before it became compulsory should be retrofitted, as they say, with uh, sprinklers. And Plainly, they, they, they should have been. There's no question. Sprinklers would have put the fire out. It would have stopped it spreading, and that's what they're designed to do. So, yeah, sprinklers, sprinklers would have worked. Nothing can bring her back, mm. but you kind of want a bit of justice for her mm. for failings that led to her death. This is what was really upsetting about Grenfell. You don't want her death to be in vain. You want answers, you know, you want lessons to be learned. And that was the main thing. At Westminster, the Conservatives were back in power. At the end of the inquest, 
the coroner's recommendations were sent to the community secretary, Eric Pickles. These included retrofitting sprinklers to all tower blocks, a review of the stay put policy, and a further review of the building regulations, including approved document B. These recommendations were very clear, so even if they had in their mind the idea that regulation was red tape and a bad thing, still they had a duty to follow up uh, these instructions that came from the coroner. Eric Pickle's response acknowledged the coroner's recommendations, but fell short of changing the regulations. It was written in, in a, a, a parliamentary language, uh, but once you'd read it a couple of times, it just, it just seemed dismissive of the recommendations. One of the upsetting facets was, I remember thinking at the time, well, it's probably going to happen again then. Eric Pickles went on to say that his department had recently written to local councils, recommending the retrofitting of sprinklers in high-rise buildings, but the changes were not compulsory. Whatever all of us did, it wasn't enough. Because if you've got something that happened and six people died, and then exactly the same happens again, and even more people died, then none of us did enough. Whether it was me as the local constituency MP, or whether it was the ministers, or whether it was people heading up the fire brigade, none of us did enough. Fire Brigade? Yeah, hello, hi. The fire is flat 16 Greenfield Tower. So we have fire where? Uh, so have flat 16 Greenfield Tower. Right, okay. Right, quick, 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 quick. The fire brigade are on their way. The fire at Grenfell Tower began just before 1 a.m. on the fourth floor. Within 30 minutes, it reached the top of the tower. Forty fire engines and over 200 firefighters have been called to this tower block. They say they received multiple calls. This building had been refurbished relatively recently. Immediately, I thought of the cladding. When you saw the flames and the way it spread, almost a mirror image and a by far bigger way to what we saw at Gamma Court. It was a thing that really disgusted me, to be honest. We've seen debris falling from the building. We've heard the sound of explosion. The actual mechanism of the fire was very similar to the Summerland fire 40 odd years ago. How can this happen in this day and age? A year before the fire, Grenfell Tower had been wrapped in cladding to improve its appearance. As Grenfell burned, those connected with the five fires watched in horror. That cladding should never have been on Grenfell Tower. It should never be in any building, uh, especially a high rise where it's going to go up. Most of what we've seen is cladding and other facade elements coming away. I despair uh, of a country that wraps residential tower blocks in flammable materials. I despair of a process which allows that to happen. I despair of people who think that's a good idea. Certainly, if there'd been no flammable cladding on the outside of Grenfell, it wouldn't have been such a serious fire. And possibly, no lives would have been lost. So that's, yeah, it's very bitter, isn't it? The Grenfell tragedy claimed the lives of 72 people. A public inquiry opened in September 2017, 
and is expected to last up to three years. The fitting of sprinklers would have been likely to have saved those lives. Well, a sprinkler system anywhere will help put out a fire. It would be a lot of money, but what price do you put in life? Like everyone else, we were told to remain in our homes by authorities. I don't know if my dad was scared or simply waited to die. He needs justice. All the victims do. As the minute ticked by, I called the fire brigade again and again. They told me to stay put. If I had not listened to the fire brigade, my son would have been likely alive today. Grenfell, as everybody now accepts, was catastrophic failure. All the way through to government and government regulation, we all share a responsibility for Grenfell. The system, as it stands at the moment, is not fit for purpose. We've had, in reality, getting on for 40 years of governments who have sought to reduce regulation in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and they use this term red tape uh, and it's quite clear that when we're talking about people's homes that uh, red tape is potentially the difference between life and death. We are here because the system failed the very system designed to protect those people. But it failed. Materials that are clearly dangerous to use in buildings are still there, up and down the country, right now. These materials are still on these buildings. The very same ones that killed our families, that killed my uncle. Right now, this is how our families are being remembered, by a culture of neglect, institutional inertia, hiding behind a system that's failed. Because until those in power listen and make changes to a system that failed, until then, only God knows how many homes are safe in this country. Do previous disasters show us that Grenfell was inevitable? The Open University explores the timeline. Go to the address below and follow the link to the Open University.